But this is the full set of plans. And if we go down through here, this is a standard set of commercial plans. And the reason we use the building that we're in is because normally we can walk around and say, hey, yeah, see that beam right there? You can see it out in the hall. It's that brace that goes across. We don't have that uh, option today since we're not down there. But someday you'll be back in the building and you could actually go around. You can actually recognize the building in most of these from the floor plan. And you can see that area in the middle with the print. That's where all the printing I've been doing is taking place. And then the classroom we normally meet in is over here. A couple of computer labs across from each other here. There's another one in the corner. And then there's a large lecture room over here. My office is right there. And then beside my office is my office that I sort of took over that also has a printer in it. And then Meredith is in the corner and Paul is right here. They have an adjunct office right there. Big, big uh, closet that they use for, for IT is over here. And um, the connection to Haig is shown right there as well. So let's go back to the PowerPoint. So uh, this is commercial construction print reading. And commercial construction requires a whole set of documents that are not just prints, but are also specifications. We don't have the whole full specification set included here, but there are some pages that are mostly text. And they're mostly text because they have all kinds of information that is not necessarily graphical. Most of what you find on a set of prints, though, is no different than what we saw in the architectural prints, or the mechanical prints, or the civil prints. They're graphical representation of some kind of design created with certain specific standards and conventions so that people familiar with those standards and conventions could understand them. The purpose of all of these, everything, anytime you do anything from a technical graphics point of view, the purpose is to create something that's clear, concise, and unambiguous. Which means I should be able to take a look at these plans and interpret them and get the same results as anyone else who looks at them if we all know what the rules are. This is fairly complex. You're not going to walk out of here being an expert at this, but what we're going to have by the end is an understanding of what is involved with reading those prints and how various sheets are connected to other sheets. Because one of the things that happens in a set of construction documents is frequently there's a reference in one page to one or more other pages and many times to one or more other pages with many drawings on that page. So I just want to show you how to navigate through that process. Um, Meredith put together a document that's also in that folder called Tips on Reading Plans. And I use that document as a way of organizing this PowerPoint. So one of the tips that she says is you always start with the title sheet, also sometimes known as a cover sheet. For the set of plans we're looking at, the Ross Technology Center, the cover sheet is this very first sheet right there. And that's the one that tells you what it is that's being drawn. Southern Maine Technical College, they called it the Technology Center. This is significant because the letter T is gonna be used throughout by the architectural firm as a reference to the Technology Center. A date's there, this was issued for bid. These are the original bid documents, by the way, which means that the building itself does not look exactly like these proposals. Um, we don't have a set of as-built. What we have is a set of as-designed. And there's always a difference. It's just, I don't believe ever in the history of the world been a building built that looked exactly when it was done like the original plan. Things happen in the process. So the prints that I made yesterday um, for the facilities department were actually as built that were corrected versions of the original plan. And the reason they wanted them scanned is because they had made some markups on them. So getting the original plans from the original architect and printing them didn't help them. They wanted to have printed out versions that showed all the markups. When the markups are things like the heating and air conditioning system had to be redesigned on the fly. I don't know why that was in that particular case. That was a set of plans for a building in Brunswick. But the fact is, there is just no such thing as a building that goes exactly according to plan. I've mentioned that before in class. If we're in the building, what I would do is walk you down two places to where my office is, where there is a clear, um, change in the way the plans should have been drawn and uh, in a different from what I had actually originally drawn. And the other place was a door that had to get moved in one of the classrooms. And because they had to move the door, because it was a structural member in the way of the opening that I had. But by the way, the, the building you're in, I drew up the plans originally that we, we submitted to Harriman and everybody else. 
Meredith and Ed Fitzgerald and I spent a lunchtime taking a, an original plan from Harriman, a big rectangle that had a hall going down the middle that was, honest to God, 12 feet wide. Huge waste of time. Halls are always a waste of space. You have to have them sometimes, but when you're designing something, the fewer halls you have, the more usable space you have in a building. Every classroom was identical in size and shape. Um, and the hallway was just this long highway that went straight down through the building and then of course connected to Hague, which meant you had this sort of bowling alley effect. We didn't like it, we redesigned it. That's why we have the area in the center for the plotters. That's why all the classrooms are odd sizes. It gave us a couple of advantages. Um, you know, I'll take a, take a look at that <clears throat> and as we go down through, but it gave us some advantages as far as the classrooms went. It gave us a huge advantage as far as the area in the middle for the plotters. And we didn't lose any classroom area, but what we did was took space out of that 12 foot hallway and made it into the plotting area in the middle. Actually, we ended up with more classroom space when we got done. So Meredith and Ed and I just sat down and literally it took 45 minutes. We had some tracing paper, we put it down. Ed, who was fantastic at drawing and sketching by hand, he sketched things out as Meredith and I, uh, and he and I talked about what we wanted to see. And then we turned it over to Harriman and then they redid the plans. Well, I thought when they built the building that the plans were gonna look like the ones we gave them and there were some things that got changed. And they got changed because in the process of building it, in one case, like I said, they had to move the door. When they moved the door, my layout for the computers completely got screwed up because the door being in a different location meant there wasn't really enough room for two rows of computers. And therefore you couldn't actually get into the classroom and go behind the tables. So we had to redo that. And then there's a big dead wasted space at the end of, actually I'll show you that one. If you look at right here, there is absolutely no reason why that wall right there, this is my office. I mean, that's not the right office number, but that's that little office next to mine. When I drew this, that wall came over here and there was a door right there. That wasn't hallway space. This office was narrow, but it was long, which meant it was actually about the same footprint as this, about the same square area as this one. The problem is that when they put the electrical in, you can see the panels right there. The electrical panels got put in that were supposed to be over here. There was a structural member, so they just got shifted to the right. Once they got shifted to the right, they, it was in the way of that wall. So instead of just redesigning it or doing something else with that, in fact, that was on the first floor. They had to shift those. In the second floor, they could have moved them back to where they were supposed to be. But they decided they wanted the first floor and the second floor to be the same. As a result, they just decided on the job, the contractor just left that wall out. And so when I first came into the building, I thought I had made the biggest rookie mistake ever, which is to have a hallway that goes right to the end of a dead end and then wastes all that space that could be part of the room that's beside it. If you've got a ranch house, ranch houses often have a hallway with bedrooms going off the hall. A ranch house design with a hall going all the way to the exterior wall is a terrible design, which is why most ranch houses, <coughs> excuse me, most ranch houses stop right there and that last bedroom has a door in, in the end right there. So that's the question, that's the difference between an as-built and as-designed. Um, actually, that is the way it was built. And again, it's not the way we gave it to them. So. Issues forbid, <coughs> excuse me, that might have been, they might have changed that after the fact when they sent this to it. Got to think about that. All right, so let's go back to, uh, let's go back to the PowerPoint. So you start with the title sheet. One of the things the title sheet has is a uh, set of a table of contents, basically a list or a sheet list. And that sheet list has a drawing system um, that, is set up this way and this is all virtually all commercial architects do this because the american institute of architects created a standard for things like layer names and floor names and and uh, system names and that standard includes a letter designation as to the type of drawing you're looking at the letter a stands for architectural look down here that's the code used by the harriman plan a for architectural, C for civil, that was all the outdoor stuff. I for interiors has to do with the, you know, what color the walls are, what kind of uh, flooring is being put down, what kind of ceiling material. M for mechanicals, which is the heating system, the duct work for the heating system. 
E for electrical, which is the entire electrical system. P for plumbing, again, all the plumbing system. And S for structural, and structural is the actual structure of the building, the I-beams, the, the uh, other kinds of um, studs and systems like joists and, uh, um, <coughs> excuse me, ceiling joists and floor joists. And so all these things uh, separate the building plan into the various different components. The other thing that normally happens on the title sheet is the name of the architects put there. This is Harriman Associates. They were the architects and engineers, by the way. Um, any architectural firm is either going to have an engineer that they contract with or they're going to have engineers in the firm to do the engineering. The engineering means, is this structural system sufficient to hold up the building? which is not the same as the architectural design, which is how is this building going to function and how is the floor plan going to be laid out, et cetera. So any kind of design that's commercial is a combination of both architects and engineers. Anybody who's an architect has to work with engineers, anyone who's an engineer has to work with architects. And good firms, those two groups get along really well and they recognize that they're supporting each other. In other firms, they tend to kind of hit butt heads a little bit. Companies up in Auburn. Um, so as far as the interpretation goes of the sheets, <clears throat> A101, or, or in their case, TA10.1, either one of those ways is a, is a way of designating, uh, designating the first level of a building. In our building, we don't call that the first floor, as it turns out, because there's a ground floor. So in our building, TA10.1, first it's architectural, 10 means floor plans, T means technology building, and point one means the first level, which is the first level on the lower level from where the first floor is. <clears throat> so there are 10.1, 10.2, and 10.3 floor plans in this set. Now, as far as the organizing system goes, this is typical of commercial construction. The A's and the hundreds, 100s up to 199 or the 10.0 up to 19.9 depending on the company and how they do it those are floor plans layout plans and reflected ceiling plans a reflected ceiling plan is a drawing of all those tiles that are hanging in the ceiling that gets reflected down onto the floor and that's a separate plan from the floor plan but when you look at it we're going to take a look at all the sheets in here you'll see that it looks like a big grid elevations typically are in the 200s or the 20s Section drawings, which means th things that have been cut through, and we've seen those both in the last class when we had architectural sections and when we were doing with mechanical class where we had mechanical sections. Those are labeled in the 300s or the 30 points. The 400s is the mechanicals, um, and in, in commercials would be the commercial kitchens, the bathroom, um, and those are large scale plans. They tend to be scaled up so you can see them. Mechanical room is a room that holds the controls for the heating system, the boiler, all the kinds of things that need to be, uh, that a building needs in order to operate. Door and window schedules and plans are in the 500s. Other schedules and those other schedules are things like finish schedules, diagrams that are related to finish schedules are in the 600s. And then the AIA standards basically leave those two available for any firm to use in any way they want. And then the 900s up and the 90s up. Um, if you're going to do three-dimensional uh, drawings or representations, and they didn't do that with the Harriman building because there wasn't really any need to, the reason normally you do 3D representation is to, as in marketing, well, not marketing exactly, but to explain to people visually who have trouble reading technical drawings what something is going to look like. So there are no 3D sections in this one. Um, so, <clears throat> coordination tools. You know, these sheets, I forget exactly how many pages. Let's go back and look. So this sheet right here has 61 pages, um, including the cover page. So there's 60 sheets of actual drawings in here. Well, you want to make sure you have a system that coordinates those things because, again, they refer back and forth to each other. And so as you get down through here, what are the techniques designed to keep track of what all this data is? So first, you've got a drawing list on the cover page. And if we look at the Ross Technology Center, the drawing list is over here on the right-hand side. So if we look right up here, it's essentially a table of contents. So if you take a look at the numbering system they use, there's a real logic to it. 
I mean, it's literally called a drawing list or a sheet list. Um, and the, number, the first one is the title block. So T stands for technology. T stands for title block. Zero, zero is the designation they use for the preface material, anything beginning this. And that's where the cover sheet's gonna be. And this is, you know, can be called a title sheet or a cover sheet. After that, you get the categories representing floor plan. So in this particular case, well, not necessarily floor plans, um, in this particular case, the next category is the civil plan. And the civil plans are the ones that involve the layout. We looked at one of these, the existing conditions and demolition plan. Did we go outside? I can't remember if we did or not. Did we go outside and look at the, uh, the slope in the backside of the building? No, I don't think so. No, we did not. Yeah, I don't think we did. Normally what I do is when we, when we deal with, no, I guess we couldn't have. We dealt with civil here. No, normally what I do when we deal with civil is we take a look at that plan, I give everybody a copy of it, and we go out and you look around and say, did this plan get executed in the way that it was drawn, or were there some changes made from the time the plan was made? And so we go out and just make a relationship between the plan and the individual elements of the existing building. So letter C is civil, and they go down through and they tell you exactly what's on each one, and then you get to architectural, and the architectural is where you start with your floor plans, Again, number one is the ground floor, number two is the first floor, and number three is the second floor. Because even though they call them first, second, and I actually think they probably should have just started by calling that the first floor, but um, it would have eliminated some real problems with everybody at the beginning of every semester, people looking for building rooms in Hague that had the same numbers as the rooms in the technology center wouldn't have been confused by that anymore because Hague would have been the second floor and we would have been the third floor. But at any rate, um, <clears throat> the roof plan is, uh, in this case, a relatively simple plan. In some uh, buildings, it's much more involved, but it's just a flat roof. And then they have the exterior elevations. Again, they're all A's because they're architectural drawing. The 20 is just a designation used by Harriman for the external elevation. The building sections here start with 25, and then the wall sections are all 30. Stair details are 35. Other details, and other details mean whatever. And in this case, the other details include windows and window types and details. We'll be looking at some of that a little later on. Door schedule, door schedule is just a list of all the doors. The room finish schedule is the materials uh, that are used in the room. And here's a legend there as well. And the legend is because they're gonna use symbols to represent different things. Typical mounting heights is common in, a, in an educational building. Well, actually probably in most buildings because you have things like bulletin boards and chalkboards and um, you know, the pull down, the screens that have to come down and things that have to be put at a specific level. Here we have the ceiling plan and the ceiling plan in a commercial building is almost always a suspended ceiling. And it's a suspended ceiling because all of the, all the wiring for each of the internet connections, all the plumbing, all the heating and air conditioning stuff, all the sprinkler system stuff, it's all above that ceiling. So the actual ceiling is about two and a half feet above where the ceiling is up there and the space in between is used for all that kind of unpleasant looking or at least cluttery looking stuff. Not sometimes more cluttery than others. And so the ceiling is basically a way of just covering up the mess, the ceiling we can see. And the materials plan, the materials in that case have to do with things like the vinyl flooring, etc. And we have a group of details here. Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot your class today. Yeah, I have a class today. I'm going to get pie and uh, do you want anything else? No, that sounds good. My wife just forgot that I was having class today, so she came in to find out if she wanted me to pick her up and wanted her, if I wanted her to pick up a pie at the uh, store where we get our frozen pies. Or I want pie. What's that? I want pie. Yeah, and I'll tell you what. <clears throat> There's a place called Windy Hill Farm. They are out on, in Wyndham on the road that goes, if you went out past the Wyndham Correction Center, um, actually you don't go past it if you're coming from Portland, you don't get that far. Um, but they've got a farm there and at the hot top of the hill, there's a little farm stand and they sell all kinds of great stuff, including their own eggs and you know canned peaches. But they sell frozen pies that are made by the Orchard Hill Pie Company in Hebron, I think, at some place in Maine. And they are the best frozen, well, I, they're the best pies I've ever had. And uh, they've got a whole cooler, I mean, a freezer just full of their pies. So <clears throat> we have now purchased so many pies during the, this whole lockdown. It's just almost embarrassing. But 
strawberry, rhubarb, blueberry, bumbleberry, apple, key lime. Anyway, never mind. We can move on. <laughs> uh, I'm hoping desperately she gets a, a, a strawberry rhubarb. So. Um, so the rest of this foundation plan, that's all the concrete work uh, that was put into it. And that's related. You notice it's not foundation plan is not on the uh, civil plan. Well, it is actually on the civil plan as well, but the foundation plan required that the structural and the S is structural. Yeah. Yeah. Let me take that back. The foundation plan itself is, let me go back and see. I have the rebar plan. Yeah, well, no, it wouldn't be the rebar plan. It would be the structural steel that's put on top of the foundation to um, site detail. No, that's all site. Yeah, maybe it is. We'll take a look. I'll tell you that. Yeah, I think that's, uh, I think it might be the rebar plan. We'll see. We'll go and look at it. Anyway, foundation plan is in, it's under the structural category, but also under that is all the other framing plans. Structural is normally framing. I'm gonna go, we're gonna go look at that right now. I just wanna answer that question. 10.1, 10 so all you have to do is get on and find 10, TS 10.1. 10 so I'm just going through until we get there. There it is right there. It is, yeah. So those are the footings, those are the footings. This is, this is the foundation plan and the concrete. That's all the concrete that was poured. Um, it does have detail, details about piers that are embedded in the concrete. It also has details about, that's probably mesh right there so that the walls don't bulge out. So yeah, this is, this is the foundation plan, it's part of the structure obviously, but it doesn't necessarily limit itself to the steel structure. Go back, back here for now. Need for plumbing. So we've got a plumbing sprinkler, big, it's a big deal in commercial buildings. All, all commercial buildings have to be sprinkled. Um, and there are some, some residences have sprinkler systems as well. Mostly it's commercial. And again, that's required. <clears throat> and then we have the mechanicals. Again, the mechanicals are things like ductwork and piping. The electrical, well, electrical, this is interesting because you also have, in some cases, in this case, they had, um, there was no building where we are, but we were attached to an existing building. And so the existing building had some elements of it that had to be demolished. Um, well, I guess there might've been a small building there too, now that I think of it. So electrical demolition means what are you going to do to remove what's already there? Um, and then the electrical goes through everything, including the, uh, the lighting plan and the floor plan. Then the panel board schedules and location of the panel boards are there as well. This is where they messed up with our offices. Okay. okay, what else coordinates things? So that list is the, is the main primary coordination tool. Excuse me. Um, then you have section cutting lines and they're on a lot of sheets and they're a line of sight arrows and sometimes they line up, sometimes they don't. We're gonna look at all the symbols and see what they mean. Let's just go back and I'll show you what I'm talking about. If you're looking at, look at one of the floor plans right there. So we're looking at a floor plan here. There are tons of symbols that look like this or like this. Now those mean two different things. Um, these are section cutting plane lines. When we looked at them in mechanical, they were just arrows. Big flat arrow going in one direction. There was no bubble on them. The line went down through where the part was being cut. Architectural plans don't use that same system because invariably, especially with commercial, if you've got a section of some kind, it doesn't show up on the same page as the plan view. So what you have here is a symbol with that bubble that indicates the, the designation for the section itself. So this is section B1. And then down below here, it shows you what page in this set you'll find that section on. It's not on the same page that the, that the cutting plane line is. The difference between these two section symbols, with the one little nose here and the other one has the little ears that come out. This one is simply cutting through locations that are local. 
So in other words, it's showing you what it looks like through this wall section. So what the purpose of that is, is for you to go and look and say, how is that wall being built? None of the rest of the building is involved, which is why that little tail comes across at a right angle. So the cut that it's being shown is from here to here. This one is a section that goes beyond the first element that it cuts through. So if we trace that line down, it stops, and it kind of looks like it would be doing the same thing. But if you've got that type of arrow in the drawing, it's gonna line up with another one on the opposite side, normally the opposite side of the building, although not always. So the difference between this, that terminates, and this, it doesn't terminate, is that this has to have another one that matches up. And you'll notice it says B1, TA 25.1. So B1 is the name of the section, TA 25.1 is a sheet that it's on. If we go and look at the one that lines right up with it, it is also B1. And it's also B1 because it's all one section. So this one is gonna be the entire building, the entire width of the building, whereas this one over here is gonna be just one wall. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now, um, you also though have other things on a print from a coordination point of view. For instance, and we're going we're gonna to see all of this stuff again. I'm really just doing the kind of overview right now. But things like this, that's an indication that there is a way that that wall is built. And the way that wall is built is going to be described by a note someplace. And I'm not sure where that note is. 243, right there. So this is the note. <clears throat> and it tells you that you're going to use three and five eighths inch steel studs. You'll notice, by the way, wooden studs are three and a half inches. Steel studs are three and five eighths. At 16 inches on center, we've looked at that when we did the architectural. And then they have to be connected to the structure above. Um, gypsum board on each side. Um, gypsum board sheetrock. And then three and a half inches of sound attenuation blankets, which are really insulation that's per that whose purpose is not to keep heat from going through, but keep sound from going through. And sound insulation is actually set up as different kind of insulation than, than thermal insulation is. And it's called sound attenuation blankets as opposed to sound proof blankets because they aren't sound proof. <laughs> sound will still get through. So they attenuate or reduce the sound that gets through, but they don't necessarily eliminate it. You know that whenever Paul and I are teaching side by side in classrooms, and everybody in each room can hear each hear the other instructor coming right through the wall. Paul's worse than I am, though. I think he says I'm worse than he is. I don't know, maybe. Detail bubbles. We just looked at that code and detail sheet reference. In other words, the code is the name or the I, the specific code. I, I you can't say number because it's normally a letter and a number combined. But that's the code of that specific detail. And then the sheet that it's on gets referred to as well. Door and window tags um, matching the schedule. We go back and look at the plan again. Um, if there's a window someplace. There's a window tag right there. That's what the W stands for. And if you go and look, there's a detail someplace that describes what that is. And there's also a window schedule that tells you in, with a description of what the window is. And that description describes a window, its size, usually the rough opening, but also what I think of as the catalog number, you know, the manufacturer and what the number that the manufacturer is assigned to that window system. So there should be a tag for every window, right? Well, there should be a tag for every window, yeah. But a lot of times, if the windows all appear to be the same, they sometimes just tag a couple of them and leave them. Uh, yeah, yeah there, sh there should be a tag for every window. If, if, if somebody screws up and just doesn't tag a window, because don't forget, people make these. It's not, they're not machines that are making these. Some people sometimes mm -hmm. overlook things. But we'll, we'll, what I have seen sometimes on prints is, for instance, all the windows in all the classrooms are identical. So they'll tag one, and the rest of them all line right up, and they'll assume that you're going to know that the rest okay. of them are all the same window. Yeah, that makes sense? Yeah. A lot of the times they'll put typical window detail. Yeah. It'll show that it's the same. Yeah, you can do that in a case where really you've basically got one window. And, um, you know, but again, personally, I think there should be a tag in every window. 
I don't think they should. I mean, that's the kind of thing where if you're saying a drawing should be clear, concise, and unambiguous, mm -hmm. the word typical is ambiguous by its nature. If you look at a mechanical part, TYP is frequently put on a mechanical part. What it means is, if anything looks like this, and we didn't put a dimension on it, use this dimension. Well, then the question is, well, if it's a full radius or a part of a radius, but they actually have the same size, are they the same or are they not the same? And now you kind of have to guess, is it typical or does it, does it have to look exactly like that one or does it simply have to have the same type of measurement? And I think the same thing, uh, Jake, from my point of view is true of windows and doors. I'd rather not guess on that one. I'd rather have people just put the symbols, especially now that they're not doing it by hand. It's not like you have to, you know, I mean, at one time when you were doing hand drawing, you do anything to avoid having to completely do every single thing, especially when you had to do lettering. So I don't think there's any reason why those symbols to me should be part of those, the window symbol and the door symbol should be built into the block that was used by the CAD system. And that when you put it in, it automatically populates with a door or window symbol that you can then change if you need to. But, um, in large plan bubbles, there's all kinds of details that are at a larger scale so you can read them. Wall tags we just looked at with this construction detail. And then there should be someplace a general information sheet, and there is in this case, and we're going to look at it, that have abbreviations and symbols and legends. So, so those are your coordination tools. This slide just kind of points out some of these things. So right over here, this is your detailed call-out tag. You're pointing at it. It's identified. There's a different scale there, and it's got a letter. Down here, there's another tag, and that's the section tag we just looked at. It has to go through to something. And by the way, it doesn't have to go straight through to something. I think I might have eliminated, no, no. In other words, this has to line up with something, but it, it's possible for it to jog down and go over, but it should have the same number. And I just took this as a piece out of uh, another print. So I don't know, I'm not sure where the other side of that is, but there does have to be another side. But the top of that is a designation for the detail itself, and the bottom is a page number. Up here, here's another one over here, is what's called an elevation tag. You're gonna show the exterior of the building from an elevation point of view. You do that square tag, so you, like, just to designate it as not a section, you're not cutting through the building, you're just looking at the outside of the building. But in every case here, that little pointed thing points in the line of sight. So in other words, you're standing here and your eyeballs are looking that way. The cutting, the, the cut here, you're standing here, your eyeballs looking that way, not down, but up. And it could be either way, but looking up is a different section than if you're looking down. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> which sheet do you go and look at for different kinds of information? So first, if you're looking for the overall building size, you're looking for lengths and widths, the floor plan is the place to do that. And this is a floor plan from the Ross Technology Center. And the reason that the floor plan is the way to go is because someplace is gonna have an overall dimension. In this case, it's right up here. And let me get my pen going here. So you've got an overall dimension here, which is gonna give you the overall length of the building. You're also gonna have an overall dimension over here, which is the overall width of the building. So if you're sizing the heating system, for instance, and you need to know what the footprint is, so you can calculate the area of the building itself, you take that number, multiply it by that number, and in this case, you'd multiply it by three, because there are three levels. That would give you the um, number of, uh, uh, I mean, that would give you the, the area, total area, the living space. But if what you're doing was calculating a ventilation system, you would actually just take that number, the footprint, times the height of the building to get the volume, and the volume of air would be determined, would be used to determine the uh, size of the heating system and the ventilation system. Stop me, folks, if there's anything that you want me to amplify. But so far, so good? Mm -hmm. Let me erase that. And I need my eraser to do that. Oh, it's not the eraser. Here we go. Um, I, I hope this is helpful. The reason I'm being so detailed about it is because every time I do this, when students first look at these plans, there are always a substantial number of people who just kind of gulp and go, oh my God, what's going on here? So I just want to make it clear to you that 
this is one of those things where you just have to take a deep breath, take a look for the system, understand the system, and then everything starts to become clear. So what if you're looking for the vertical dimensions? You know, again, we'll go back to doing uh, a plan for the overall volume. You look for some kind of an elevation or a section view. So if you look right here, this is the elevation view and it shows you right here, that's the height of the first level from here to here. And those are level symbols. In other words, finish floor, finish floor, finish floor, which is different than, this, than the subfloor or the rough floor. Bottom of deck means the bottom of the roof deck. And that means that above that is going to be, you know, the, the bit of thing and, you know, material that they use and tar and whatever else they put up there, sometimes aggregate. There are going to be scuppers up there. There's going to be all sorts of things. Uh, condenser in this case, which is the air conditioning system. So each one of those symbols right there is just a target or a datum symbol. And, and in, in architectural, that normally represents not necessarily the finish floor, but in commercial, it usually represents the finish floor. So you want to know how high this building is. There's your answer right there. And on the other end, probably it's got the overall height. So if the information you're looking for is vertical dimensions, an elevation or a section view drawing is what you want to find. Um, clear, all, come back up. All right. Finishes on the floor, walls, ceilings, etc. You know what color paint's going to be used. You're going to have carpeting and not have carpeting and have vinyl flooring, whatever. You look for a room finish schedule. This is what the room finish schedule looks like in the technology building. Um, and it tells you, it designates where it is. In this case, it says lobby. Um, the floor is going to be porcelain tile, which is why that tile cleans up so well. It's a really expensive but high quality tile. Um, the stairs have rubber on them. You know, the, elevation, the elevator in the machine area is sealed concrete. Um, and then you go from the floor to the base of the wainscoting. If there is any wainscoting, there isn't in most of our places, there isn't the men's toilet. Ceramic tile, it's just a, up from the floor, there's ceramic tile. And then above that, there's a gypsum board. And what are the walls going to be? Gypsum board, uh, gypsum board, gypsum board, gypsum board. And the ceilings of the exposed structure. Uh, color number, that actually it should be the color number of the tiles. And there's something else over here I can't see. But the point is that when you design a building, you've got to take into account all these things. What are you going to put on the floors? What are you going to put on the walls? The bathroom is going to be dealt, dealt with differently than the other rooms, etc. You want more detail? Then you dig deeper. So we've looked at one of these already, and that is a tag indicating that there's going to be a section through that wall. A section through that wall is limited to that wall. You know that because it's just got the little, well, not a nose in this case, a little cap, but it doesn't have the ears sticking out. So now if you look at that A3, TA30.1, the TA30.1 says go find another sheet. In the lower right-hand corner of all the sheets is the sheet number. This um, floor plan is not the same sheet as this detail. If you look at the detail, there's a sheet number. Um, and then there's details on the sheet, one of which is A3, which doesn't show here, but another one is A1. So there's detail A1, and if you look here, that's a section detail at, I can't read the scale, too small, but it's a different scale probably. Yeah, it looks like it's a, this is probably an eighth inch equals a foot scale, and this is probably a quarter of an inch equals a foot scale. We'll look at, we'll look at the actual plan when we get to it, and we can decide there. Um, structural details. <clears throat> so here we have, um, Another, another uh, detail, and this is detail A1, but it's on a structural sheet. And this one you can see right here. The scale is three quarters of an inch equals one foot. So don't forget, an eighth of an inch is a very typical scale in the United States, nowhere else in the world. Eighth of an inch equals one foot, and architects go nuts if you don't put the zero in there. I don't know why, but they do. At any rate, so an eighth of an inch is what's typical of the entire building. If you want something a little more detail, you go to a larger scale. And a larger scale would be a quarter of an inch equals a foot. 
that would be typical for the entire building of a residence because residences are nowhere near as large as commercial buildings. Um, but in commercial buildings, that's often used for certain details. But then if you really want to show something, you go to three quarters, three quarters of a foot, uh, three quarters of an inch equals one foot. The scale is three times the scale of this, which means the detail you're looking at is three times bigger than it would be if you drew it at a quarter of an inch scale and six times bigger than if you drew it at an eighth of an inch scale. So you do that because you wanna, and this probably has more, inf more interesting stuff up here, um, but you do this because you wanna show clearly to the person doing the structural exactly how that structure is gonna integrate between the vertical and the horizontal pieces. This also, by the way, and we'll take a look at this later too, notes appear all over the place. And when you see a note, people tend not to read them read them. So it tells you there's a more additional detail not shown here where well, it, it points you to other sheets. So if you're looking and saying, well, there's something I need to know and I don't see it here, you look at the note and that might give you a clue as to where to go. A scale bar, by the way, which is what that is, scale bars are added, even though that's the scale the drawing was done at, but they're added because frequently prints are Xeroxed or copied um, they become something that it, they're not the original size the print was. So the purpose of a scale bar is to say, listen, from here to here on this drawing represents, that is, represents one foot in real life, which means that distance from here to here is three quarters of an inch. So if we were going to measure that with a ruler, that would be three quarters of an inch right here. And the reason it's there is so that if the detail gets, pr gets printed at a different, you know, you put in the Xerox machine and blow it up or bring it down or whatever you do, where that is no longer the scale that the drawing was actually done at, you can figure out how much bigger or smaller it is by measuring that distance and comparing it to three quarters. Does that make sense to everybody? Yep. Yep. Good. Um, all right, let me clear that all again and come back out. Wall tags, we looked at wall tags briefly, we'll look at them again. Wall tags show you the material, sometimes the fire rating, whether or not it needs insulation. We saw that in the one we just looked at, the sound attenuation or thermal insulation and specific information about the word partition is misspelled right there. There is a spell check in, in uh, AutoCAD folks, by the way, and, and you could just, you might want to use it when you do a drawing before you actually turn it over to someone. Um, so there's a tag and you can see how that, and there's a bunch of stuff going on right here. That's the elevator right there out in our lobby. So, um, so you look at the elevator and it's got all kinds of tags. And these are wall tags here that go through the area. And there's another wall tag here, there's another wall tag there. If you look at 348 with a little, whatever those, ver those horizontal lines here, it's saying that this wall section right here is described in that note, eight inch steel studs. 16 inches on center, connect to above, five eighths um, gypsum board, each side all the way up, eight inches of sound attenuation, blankets, insulation, support anchors, one hour fire rated. One hour fire rated means it's designed so that if there's a fire raging on one side, it will take an hour for it to burn through that wall and start a fire on the other side. Um, fire rating is uh, measured in hours, how much time it takes to burn through. If you uh, have an attached garage, to your house there has to be fire rated sheetrock between well fire rated wall that's almost always done with fire rated sheetrock between the garage and your house and different municipalities will have different fire ratings required you know, it might be a one hour it might be a two hour fire rating um and again if you have two hour fire rating you have to make it more fireproof fire resistant doors and window schedules there is a uh, sheet in this case, the T Technology Building A Architectural 55.1 Door and Window Schedules. It has window types and details. So there is a sill detail someplace, and that sill detail you notice got even bigger as a scale. Three inches on the drawing is equal to one foot. So the distance from here to here is actually only an inch and a half on that scale bar. Um, and the A1 is the name of this uh, sill detail. 
but why is the sill detail drawn so much larger? I mean, that's, that's not three times larger. That's not 12 times larger. That's 24 times larger than the original floor plan itself. And obviously the reason is because you've got detail you would never be able to show if you drew this at a scale that was smaller than this. In this case, you've got, that's the outside brick wall. That's the sill of a window. If you remember in our classrooms, we have these birch sills that have a little, it's called a bull nose when it does that. Um, we have a birch uh, sill and a birch apron. Quite nice looking, actually. Nice wide sill on there. And then you have um, some insulation material. You've got the brick in here. And if you're not sure what that means, we're going to see that later on where you have a legend that tells you what the various symbols mean. There's insulation in this wall. That insulation is batting insulation, which is what that symbol means. Probably fiberglass. Actually, I'll, I'm, I'm gonna go out on a limb and tell you it's fiberglass. And if you notice, there's an eight inch cavity here. So it's a pretty wide wall, so it's quite well insulated. And the brick, in this case, doesn't, ha doesn't add anything to the insulation. It's just kind of out there. Um, so that's what I'm gonna show on this. Yeah, so stuff like here, where you have the seal, ceiling. Here's a case right here. Jake was talking about the use of typical seal tip. And, you know, in this case, I don't really object to that because what it's saying is, listen, if you've got a sill anywhere in this building, seal the damn thing. Um, so that there's a case where I'm going to take back my complaints about use of TYP because essentially it's saying, oh, there's a sill with seal on it and it's typical. We better seal every single window then. That's different than having a type of window and calling it typical because that isn't necessarily true of everything. So what sheet for information is needed? And again, we'll go back to the lettering thing. Mechanical, electrical, and plumbing called MEP as a group. And that's often seen as one discipline, even though it's three, four, actually. Electrical is one, structural, plumbing, and mechanical. So I took from the front page, I just took a section of the sheet listing. And if you notice, the structural was on TS 60.1 framing notes. Plumbing, TP is all the plumbing sheets. And this drawing, uh, this set of uh, plans only has three sheets for plumbing. Then the mechanicals down here, go to the first floor plan ductwork. Um, and the first floor is, is uh, two, ground floor is one. Second floor would be three, and would be the same designation, TM 10.3. General notes, you can put general notes anywhere. And general notes might be on a whole page. You could literally have two, three, four pages of nothing but general notes in a, in a set of construction documents. But they also frequently appear individually near the area that they refer to, and we saw that a little earlier. They're usually important. I do, I will say sometimes it's just boilerplate. They just paste the same general note on every, every sheet and it's basically something like contractors if, must feel verify all dimensions or something that you see over and over again so you stop reading them. The problem is general notes can have really important information. So I looked around this set of plans for a note that I thought had some really good, inf really critical information. And you notice this came from the civil, one of the civil plans. Uh, tells you a little bit about the fact that, you know, in other words, the architect saying, we didn't do the survey on this. Owen Haskell did the survey on this. So don't blame us if there's something wrong with the survey. Then if you want to see some details, here's where to go. But this is the note that to me was the most significant. We found a gas meter, but we couldn't find the underground gas line. So before you start digging it up, it'd be a good idea to talk to the utility company to find out where that underground gas utility is. Now, this is not just a good idea. You probably knew that um, we had an explosion, a propane explosion in Maine uh, during the past year that killed some people and severely, I don't know, actually maybe it didn't kill anybody, but it severely injured. Did anybody die in that, people know, remember? No, I don't think so. nobody did. Yes or no? No. No, okay. But somebody just got out of the hospital and the whole building was leveled. And if the if the um, custodian hadn't moved everybody out of that building, there would have been who knows how many people would have died. So the point is, sometimes general notes are like, oh, yeah, oh, somebody else did it. Oh, there's another place to go. Oh, I could die, okay? 
So the point I'm making here is people tend to overlook general notes thinking that they're always boilerplate and they aren't always boilerplate. This is one of those things, if you're gonna bring in there coming into the backhoe and you don't know that there's an underground utility that carries gas and you start digging it up, you can end up breaking through that line. What else? Oh, what does that mean? All right, now, when you start asking the question, what are the things I'm looking at mean? I don't understand that. There are several places to go for help on that. In this particular sheet, uh, set, there's a sheet called abbreviations and legend. Again, T for technology building, T for title block. This is all right on the title block <clears throat> that it tells you, I mean, it's all part of the title block. 10.1, that should be the second sheet in the set. We'll go and look and see if it is. It is, okay. So it's part of the title block, the title material. This is a cover sheet, that's the title material. Um, and that's the sheet that has all the abbreviations. We'll look at this in more detail in just a minute. Now, what does it have on there? Symbols used as abbreviations. I don't like the letter L used to mean angle. I think it should be the less than symbol. I think it's less likely to be confused, but in this case, that's too bad if they have an angle and they want to indicate that a number is an angle, I'll put an L in front of it. C, L is a common, very typical way of designating the center line on something, and the L is always dropped down and off to the side. This one is important to know because normally on a print that means property line. For them, it means plate, so it's something they're going to use in the structural drawings, not in the civil drawing. A badly drawn diameter symbol, not sure just why, um, but you know they want you to know that means diameter. C means channel. You might not know that if you weren't um, aware. So what they're basically saying is if we've got a structural drawing and there's a letter C followed by some numbers, we're saying there's a piece of channel iron that is a specific side. And then square has the same meaning really that diameter does, except it means it's all the same dimension in two different directions as opposed to all the same dimension everywhere. Then you'll have abbreviations. This particular set has an enormous number of abbreviations, many of which are never used in this set. And the reason they're never used in this set is, this is boilerplate. In other words, any abbreviation that's ever been used by this firm in any place on any sheet gets thrown into the mix here so that they don't overlook something on a particular set of drawings. The only reason to mention that is, you might be confused by saying, I didn't see a tack board abbreviation anywhere here, or a test boring or whatever. So they don't limit the abbreviation, and rightly so. They don't limit the abbreviations identified in any one set of construction documents only to the abbreviations used in that set. They basically say, in our firm, if you see those letters and don't know what they mean, this is what they mean. This becomes a problem, by the way, when companies work with other companies because abbreviations are not necessarily standardized. In other words, one architectural and engineering firm might use an abbreviation for one thing, and some like the PL, for instance. You know, an engineering firm, PL, you know, set up like that, um, when I just showed you, wherever it is. Oh, up here. So, yeah. So that PL right there, that PL right there, you know, you, they might be working with an engineering firm where the PL doesn't mean plate, it means property line instead. So there is sometimes a problem when two different organizations are working together and they're each developing prints. And it turns out that they have somewhat different meanings for the abbreviations. Uh, the other... Okay, this is also comes from the, uh, the front page and it just shows you, it just shows you how they indicate the location of details on different drawing sheets and what the details are called. So the drawing sheet itself is gonna be identified here and then the details here and then the drawing sheet. This is on the detail itself. Here's where they show you the difference between a building section, whether it's gotta be two of those, and a wall section that goes through one and then trips over. And then over here, you'll see examples of the types of symbols that are used for various purposes. So that's earth. Um, now, they, they just say earth on this one. Most firms make a distinction between earth and undisturbed earth. And one way to do that, and I, you might remember this from the last class, 
one way to do that is to take that symbol. And by the way, normally it's just three or four lines. In their case, it's five. But you take that same symbol and you just rotate it 45 degrees. So it looks like this, kind of. And then one of them means Earth and the other one means undisturbed Earth, usually. In this case, they don't make a distinction. Uh, concrete, that's actually a fairly typical symbol for concrete. But you'll notice something. Porous fill, stone or gravel, and concrete, you'd be hard pressed to distinguish between those two in many cases. Um, so it's a good idea to be able to read those symbols, but sometimes the symbols are, even if they're just fine, they're a little bit confusing. That's not exactly a typical concrete symbol either. Concrete symbols are almost always, in my experience, triangles representing the particular, I mean, representing the aggregate and not little round things. And then porous stone is all round instead of triangular, usually. Uh, all right, now, okay, so now, Key symbols, those are some examples. Key symbols, if you look at all the rest of the symbols here, that's a building section It goes all the way through. Well, it goes through to something else. In other words, it's defined by two different designations with the same um, name. And like I said, it is possible for one of those to be here, to do that. And then in here, you'll find line up with a corner another corner, and then over here, and then this and this have the same letter designation and saying we're going to cut through the building like this, we're going to jog over and then cut through like that. So they don't have to line right up through the entire building. They can be what are called offset sections. Um, yeah, elevation is interesting because that's not how they designated elevations on this print, I don't think. Maybe that was on the other one. That's another way of elevation being designated. But they're showing, I guess they do do that. No, I'm sorry. I, I was confusing this with one of the examples that uh, from another set of prints. So forget that. You clear that off or it shows up on the video. Uh, the difference between these two is that there's no line coming out here. So by itself, it hangs out. And that's just, that would be on the outside of the building showing you an elevation. A detail means it's circling something. So something in here that is showing you a detail of. And then you've got the, <clears throat> the detail number above and you've got the page number below. Column references, um, structural drawings have column references that are basically a grid showing you lines that are vertical, lines that are horizontal. And they're called column references. And if there are columns, then they're up and down. And there's letters. Wait a minute, let me think about that. One of them will use letters, the others will use numbers. We'll look at the print and see what they did on this one. And then we saw some of this, this is partitions marking. So they, they go through a wall and then they um, indicate to you what the, what the wall system is set up as. All right, we got four more slides on here before we actually look at the prints. Yeah, this one, we'll look and see if we could find one. This is an interior elevation marker. What that means is this, if you've got a print, oh, did I just stop? I did. I'll go back. If you've got a print, so I'm just going to draw a sort of overall floor plan. So let's say there's our overall floor plan right here. And you've got a, a room over here someplace. And what you want to do is show each of the four elevations, each of the four walls that are perpendicular to each other. If you draw a symbol that looks like that, you end up with four arrows. Then you put your symbol in here, and what it's showing you is that you're looking at elevations this way, this way, this way, and this way, and then you designate those elevations, <coughs> excuse me, um, on a sheet. So it's a way of just putting an interior elevation marker so that you can see what's going on. Now, this would indicate four different directions. So what you do is you just eliminate the ones for that elevation, and then you do the same thing for each of the others, but there's no mark, there's no line coming off it to show that it's a section. So without a line, it's not a section a marker, it's an elevation marker. Each room is given a space number. The numbers don't match what they ended up with in the case of this plan. 
equipment numbers. So if you've got, you know, a boiler of some kind, you could do that. It's got rounded corners. The door or borrow light number. Um, a borrow light is a light that you have in a wall to bring in. It's a window or a piece of glass, often frosted, that you have in a wall to bring light into the room or the glass that's in the door itself. So the idea here is that the purpose of that glass is not to look outside the building or even necessarily to look at anything, it's to get light from one place to another, otherwise it wouldn't be it. So there's your door symbols, there's your window symbol. Level line means, that's like from a surveying tool, it's a target for the level, so those are used for each of the floors. If you revise something, in this case, they're using triangles, it's very typical. And, and on prints like this, revisions happen all the time. The revisions are normally right above the title block or in the title block someplace. And the revision number, normally they start at the top of the title block and they go up. So revision one is here, revision two is here, revision three, revision four. There's a date of some kind, somebody has to sign the revision, then there's a description of what it is. And there's usually a reference to the location on the drawing where that revision took place. North arrow, this is the magnetic north. We talked about that in one of the other classes. That true north and magnetic north are almost never the same. Um, but it also tells you you're not going to see magnetic north except on the site plan. There's no reason to do that on any other plan. Um, I think there might be a reason actually, but at least <clears throat> they're not going to do it in this case with the magnetic. So the north arrow that might show up on a, a floor plan, for instance, is really just so you can identify the north wall, the south wall, the east wall, the west wall, etc. Um, I let me see where I was going with this. Oh, so then what I was doing here, this is from the from the cover page, and so you know the architect will have the architect's stamp, the architect's uh, information, but also has an architect stamp, and you'll notice there is a specific registered architect who has a personal stamp. That personal stamp is like a notary has, and they put that on the physical drawing, which is why paper drawings are still required for these things because they become part of a contract. Once he does that and normally signs across it, he has now taken full responsibility for everything in that set of plans, which means he has to trust the people who drew the plans up and did the design and the engineers, etc. But he's the one who's licensed. This is why engineers get paid good money, and this is also why engineers have to have a certain amount of confidence because he's identified as the person responsible if something goes wrong with this building. Oh, the other thing that, that you'll notice that they did is indicate the kinds of codes that were used um, to determine how to, how to design this. So you've got the, the Boca codes are really standard. Uh, the, Jake, you might have to help me out here. Boca building organization. Do you remember? Um, I don't know the Boca codes. Usually, whenever we deal with something, it's the the ICC or the IBC or things like that. Okay. Yeah, this is it's a national standard. Um, build B stands for building, and A stands for association construction. I think I don't remember what the L stands for. I think it's building. Officials code or something like that? Yeah, could be. The fire protection code is the NFPA. This is building standards. Um, and uh, this is also a fire protection. There's also Americans with Disabilities Act. So what they're doing basically saying is we're looking at the codes that we followed and the dates of the dates of the codes were published. Um, then it also has some general information. So if you need to know what the ground floor area and the first floor area and the second floor area is and the total square footage, um, one of the questions we ask is, what's the total square footage of this building? And most people go and start measuring the building up. But you don't normally have to do that because that kind of general information will often appear on a title sheet. And then number of stories, the total height of the building, fire suppression, the maximum distance you have to travel to exit the building. And then what's the occupant load? They designed this for 100 square feet per person. So everybody, if we filled the building right up, with as many people as possible, you'd all have a 10 by 10 area that you could stand in. That'd be a lot of people. Hey, Dan, I got to go for, to go to work. So yeah. thank you.
You're welcome, Ben. Um, I will, uh, I'll send you the link to this, whatever else we do. What I'm yeah. going to do right now, Ben, is go and look at the drawing. We're going to go through each sheet, and I just want to point out a few things about each sheet. So enjoy your job today, and thanks for, for going to work, and uh, make some money, pay your taxes, so I can stay employed, okay? All right, thank you. All right. And then these are, these are the drawings. We actually went through these already, but those are the drawings from, the, from this particular set, okay? That's my PowerPoint. Any questions about that? No. Yes. Oh, I, I no question. <laughs> Sona, do that again. I said no question. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> do you feel like you have a little better handle on commercial prints right now? Yeah, that was oh, helpful. Yeah. Okay. Matthias, do you have something? Yeah, I think just to see the whole like table of contents and just how it's laid out was helpful. Just kind of the overview, like you said. Yeah. Well, I'm going to open up the plans now, and I want to walk through those plans, and I'll show you the, the exercise questions. Um, I'm not going to go through and do all those questions right now. For one thing, it would take a long time. It would be sort of a lot of going back and forth, but at least I want to show you, um, I want to do, I want to, to take a look at every sheet and just uh, say a couple words about every sheet, and I'll show you where the questions are. And then if you want, you bring up those questions and start going through and see if you can find that information. This is absolutely one of those cases where the more time you spend looking at um, the uh, looking at commercial plans, the more comfortable you are with how they work. And I, I think, I'm glad you said that because I was hoping with this document to give you something you could then take with you that would help you organize and, and develop an approach and a strategy to dealing with reading prints like this. So let's get out of this one and let's go right to the beginning and let's start right here. We've spent enough time on this one, so we'll go down here. This, you notice, there really are a ton of different abbreviations here and you know symbols that you need to use. And this is one of those things where if you're just scratching your head about something, stop scratching your head, just go back and look and see what something means. Mm -hmm. This is a site plan. This is a site plan that was an existing condition. This is before the building was actually built. Here's a site plan that has a north arrow with magnetic. The north, in this case, points down in this direction. So um, if we look, this Pickett Street right there. There was a building here and a bunch of trees, just kind of a grassy area here. Well, this is a gravel parking lot, that's right too. But the rest of this, that was a house actually. We bought the house and tore it down, we as in the school. I didn't actually pay for it myself. Um, and then there were some, you know, parking areas. You know, we still, Adam Street existed at the time. There was a great big area right here, but primarily what we had <clears throat> is a building that had to be taken away that was next to the Hague building. So there was a building here, and I'd kind of forgotten that. There was also another building here. The Hague building was a company at one time that had extremely large pieces of equipment and they were making, huh, I forget what they were making. I think they were forging chain links or something, but really massive stuff. And that building was there for a while because the state leased the building to them. And so when I first got hired, they were still actually doing stuff in there. And it was a commercial application and they just leased the building from the school. Making a change to this because it was really a, basically an industrial large industrial facility. Turning that into a classroom was really a chore. Um, and the underside of that building is still quite open. You know, facilities uses it for storage and for doing other kinds of things. So the idea was, let's put a building up. And you know, that little area right there is that steep bank, that's still a steep bank that goes up to a higher elevation. And then the you know, technology building was put right in here. There's your gas meter here. And that's the one where they're going, well, there's a gas meter. There must be gas lines underground. We don't know where they are. Figure it out. You know, there's an indication catch basins are the things that drain um, water away from an area. They had to be taken into account. Then we have the site layout. And that's when they decided this is where the building is going to go. It's funny. We argued strenuously with them 
that we wanted that building to be over here. And we wanted the building to be over here because we wanted to be able, at the time we didn't actually realize, we didn't know at the time we were gonna have the IT department on the ground level. It looked like the ground level was gonna be used primarily as storage. And we thought, and when I say we, I mean Ed Fitzgerald, Meredith Como and I, that if this building were over here, <clears throat> that then there would be an overhead door possibility. We could back a truck right up into this thing, and then we could put things in and take things out and use it for storage. Secretly, we also wanted the office in the corner that Meredith has to have a window that looked out over the ocean, thinking it won't make any difference to them where they put it, but they adamantly refused. And I think part of it is that we made so many other changes that they got cranky about it. When we said we don't like the floor plan and we wanted to change that, they resisted that a little bit as well, which just makes no sense. Because if you're an architectural firm, your job is to meet the needs of your customer. And they did do the interior the way we wanted to, and I'm glad they did. I really, I think it's worked out in many ways so much better than what they gave us. But we lost on that one at any rate. They might also have had some good reason that they never articulated to us. And maybe that structurally it wasn't gonna work as well to get that close to that area. I'm not sure, but. Um, Site grading and erosion control, these are two different plans because that's really just how we're gonna put the building in, where it's gonna be sited. But you notice there's no contour lines, there's no indication of how water is gonna flow. This is all, what are we gonna to do to make sure that water flows away from the building? And those contour lines, you remember, those are the ones where they get larger by one foot. And the closer they are together, the steeper that is. So that's a fairly steep bank going up. The difference in elevation between here and here is 11 feet. So you're standing right here, you're walking up a hill on the street, and there's also still a bank up here. So by the time you get all the way up here, there's 25 feet. Down here, you've got 11.7 feet. So the difference between that point right there and this point right here is fairly substantial. Utilities are separated just because the utilities are it just was a cleaner drawing that way and they could give it to the people who were installing the utilities and doing the excavation. Here you have the site details. And the site details are specific, and these are probably all boilerplate as well, and most of them are. They didn't do this. Most of the design of this building was off the shelf stuff, including the entire building to begin with. Um, and also these details are boilerplate as well because the details are for the kinds of things that they do all the time. And so they have these details they pull out just to make sure people do things correctly. So if we look right here, for instance, we got the structural con concrete door. Uh, and then they're showing you that there's an under drain assembly. And that under drain assembly has a drain. It's all encased. It's covered, surrounded by gravel. The reason is that that drain has holes in it in the bottom so water going down can seep up into the drain and then run out. The holes are in the bottom, by the way, not the top. But it has to be surrounded by gravel. And the reason for that is so the holes don't fill up with, uh, with dirt. So the gravel sub-base, gravel sub-base they have here is really extensive. And it's a way of increasing the amount of um, drainage that can take place where the water can drain down through. You'll notice that many of the details are labeled not to scale. And the reason is because they don't want to have to worry about putting them in there at a specific scale when they're copying them from all kinds of other places. So in one set of drawing, they might have this at a scale of a half inch equals a foot. In another, they might have it at a scale of one inch equals a foot. So they just drop it in, make sure it's readable and call it not to scale. So you won't put a scale on it and try to measure it and come up with any meaningful information. These details are more, how was this, uh, configured rather than what are the exact sizes. Even over here, in some place there is going to be a stair plan that is going to be a little more specific, but it shows you the details of a typical outside set of concrete stairs with a concrete railing. And even this one is not to scale, but they do put the dimensions in here. And that those dimensions are significant but it doesn't necessarily tell you exactly what the sizes are because as we learned last time, you have to start with the total rise when you're dealing with stairs. Then you have to pick a specific riser height and then try to match that riser height by dividing it into the total rise and then going backwards to take how many risers we're gonna have, divide that into the total rise and then come up with an actual riser height. 
So they're not giving a riser height here because they don't exactly know when they put this detail in how much of a height difference is going to be. That makes sense, folks? Yep. You notice how many things we're talking about here. Where I'm referring back to stuff all the way back to the beginning of the print reading part after we started doing the, even some of the calculation stuff. So that everything we did, even though it seemed like, oh, mechanical parts, that's not what I'm interested in. I want to do architectural. Architectural, I want to do this, whatever. All of these things come together in the sense that they're all techniques used to accurately represent technical things graphically. So a lot of what we're talking about here is familiar to you because we keep going back to things that we dealt with earlier. Mm. Just in case somebody's not familiar, precast just means that it's cast someplace else and brought on site in its cast form. And so a concrete truck doesn't pull up and do this. That catch basin, somebody makes those. There's a company that makes catch basin. They load them on a flatbed. They deliver them. They drop them into a hole. And then, you know, you go from there. Much more control that way. What is this? More site details. We already looked at those. Okay, so the ground floor plan. Here's the ground floor plan. At the time, the ground floor plan was this wide open because we had no intention or no, well, we had no specific plans for it, except we knew that all of the furnace and the boilers and all the mechanical stuff was going to go over here. The rest of it they thought was going to be wide open, which is why we wanted them to move it down here so that right there, you could, I mean, if we had an overhead door there, you see, you would have had to back up, go in here, and then do that. Whereas if we moved it out, it would have been more space for them. So that's why we were thinking at the time. Now, since then, they've finished it off, and that's where the IT department is. And they're dealing with the mechanical room, and the mechanical room also includes, by the way, all the servers and other kinds of uh, information technology things. So this makes a lot of sense that it's now been turned into a series of offices, there's storage over here where they store kinds of electronic stuff. There's a big open area down here if you've ever been down there. There's a conference room here. There are some offices in this space right here. And actually there's some offices. Yeah, there's offices here. There's offices here. There's a conference room. There's an open area right there. And the help desk is right there. So when you get downstairs, those are the doors you walk through to get to the IT department. First floor plan looks just like the second floor plan, but I like the second floor better because that's where I live. Well, I, I do kind of live there sometimes. 10.3 because it's the third level, even though it's the second floor. And that's why all the numbering starts with three. And we looked at this before, but this is the, this is the thing that, that we were, I'm really pleased that we did. Because the original plan, the hallway started here and came out this wide and just went straight down through the building to here, straight back through the building to here, and the doors lined up, I think. Maybe they didn't, but the hallway was straight, so I think maybe the, maybe the door was on one end, one side here, another side there. So when you came up the stairs and looked down, you saw this huge like tunnel or highway going all the way down through to the other end. Visually, I don't like that. That's really an aesthetics kind of thing. I don't think it feels good. I think it feels really utilitarian. And when they did that with that really wide hall, they had that classroom, so one, two, three, four, five classrooms, all of them were the same size. What we wanted was an area that we could put the noisy stuff in, the plotters, you know, the drawers, the drawers we have that are, that are metallic, that open up and close. We wanted a place for students to kind of congregate. And the other thing we did not want, we didn't want a line of sight that went all the way down here. So what happens, you look down here now and you can't see the other end of the hall, you see into the plotting area right there. We've got all that stuff that Paul put up for the um, Internet of Things here. And you've got, we've got a plotter here, we've got another plotter over here, I've got a big drafting table here, a drafting table here, a set of drawer stacks over here. And right now there are six high, highly specialized printers that are printing away. And then over here, we've got a classroom. Now this is a weird little thing. There's two doors in this classroom because the, the uh, area of that classroom got to the point where it required two separate exits. When a room gets to be a certain size, you have to be able to get out of it from two different points of view. From a safety point of view, it might've made more sense to put a door over here because those doors are so close together that if you're right here, the chances are you can get through one or the other but it's really a capacity issue when they have an additional exit. So if we have 40 people in here 
and all of a sudden there's a fire and everybody goes piling down to that one door, you get a big bottleneck right there. So it is still helpful to have two different doors here in the event that you had to evacuate that room in a hurry. This is the area that still bugs me every time I see it. I have to tell you, there's part of me that wants to go in and just tear that wall down and put up a wall here, put a door in and turn that into a real office. There was a time when I worked there that we would do things like that. The building that we used to be in before this one, about a year and a half after, well, about a year after I got hired, which is 33 years ago, I said, you know, we've got this huge, huge room that I have to walk through the back of this classroom to get to my office, and it's just too big anyway. Why don't we put a wall up? And Ed and I said, yeah, let's do that. And we got Rodney Gray, who was the chair of the Construction Technology Department. And over a weekend before classes stopped, we put up a wall. We got the electrician to come and inspect the wiring, we wired it up. Rodney built us a door, he cut all the studs. Ed did all the sheetrock work, we had it painted. And the vice president, Bill Warren, had no idea we were doing it. And he shows up on Monday and he comes above the building and he looks at the wall and just shakes his head and goes, you guys know you're supposed to ask permission. <laughs> we go, oh yeah, that's right too. He goes, did the electrical, did the electrician inspect that wire? Yeah. All right, just shook his head and walked away. Since then, I've talked to him, and he actually identifies that as something he's proud of, that we used to do stuff like that. But anyway, any questions about the floor plan itself, about the layout? You can visualize it, right? You've been there. Mm -hmm. We've all been in one of those two rooms. All set? Yep. All right. The roof plan. Well, the roof plan has to be set up so water runs off of the plan. <clears throat> and these crickets are things that are designed to disp disperse water. And you've got a number of other details here as well. Um, this is a membrane roof, which means it gets rolled out with bituminous material of some kind. Bitathane is the uh, brand name of some of the material that gets used. It's a really thick kind of rubber material. It's a rubber bituminous material. Um, at any rate, there's not a whole lot to see in the roof plan, um, on a flat roof especially. Here's a, here's a standard elevation. This elevation is, like, is designated in the uh, site plan with a, with a symbol that's outside of the, uh, of the building looking back at it. So Willie's looking at the side of the building with all the windows. And you'll notice here's the window designations, the window tags excuse me, that Jake was mentioning. And so these windows aren't identical. And the reason they aren't identical is this unit has an uh, a awning window that opens, and this window doesn't have an awning unit, unit that opens. And so the only difference between these windows, and you'll notice that if, if those ever get open, you know, every other one uh, can be open. The reason they're up there is because they're designed to discourage people from opening them. And they're designed to discourage people from opening them because the building was going to be air conditioned. It is air conditioned. But there were times, actually, they didn't have money to put the air conditioning in at first. So when we first started using this building, it was wicked hot in there. So we had these windows open all the time, which is why we have the rolling staircase to open and close them. Because otherwise, people were standing on stuff and falling off of chairs and stuff. This is a section elevation. This is just a general section elevation, but you'll notice the structure of this is not like a house. You know, you don't have joists here. Um, what you have instead is beams and trusses. This is a truss. A truss is a series of small units, smaller than solid. In this case, they're metal. So you have a metal plate and another metal plate, and they're connected with these webs. And those webs are metal as well. But the truss creates a series of triangles and it makes a very strong structure. And for buildings the size of this building, it is typical to have a truss like this. The truss distributes the load really nicely. And because they're all triangles, the geometry of a triangle makes it an incredibly rigid shape. And just to make a point here and why triangles show up so much, if I have a triangle and I compare that to a square, and I've got structural material, uh, structural members that are built as a triangle or structural material, uh, structural members built as a square. If I want to change the angle of any of those angles, 
I can only do it if I change the length of one side of the triangle, which means if I'm going to push this and attempt to get it to move so that the angle here is different, I'm going to have to either stretch or compress one leg of that triangle or more in order for that to happen. So the fact that those are steel means that they resist both compressing and stretching. If I've got a rectangle and do the same thing, it is possible to change the angle without changing the length of any of the sides. And by putting force on here, that could happen, and that's called racking. And anybody that's ever built anything, like a bookcase or anything else, knows that if you don't want that to happen, you turn the rectangle into a triangle by doing that. Now you've got two triangles, which means you can no longer change any of these angles without changing the length of one of those sides. And the length of one of those sides, if it's made out of whatever it's made out of, either you have to break it or you have to bend it. And so it makes a much more stable shape than virtually any other shape. You'd have the same problem if it were a hexagonal shape. You know, no matter what, Triangles are the only way to have a stable geometric shape, and that's why they get used all the time in building, and that was something discovered in ancient times, and that's why so many things you see have triangles built into them. That was quite obvious to everybody, but these are the wall sections, those little tags that go just part way through a wall, and they show you again, there's your structural members at a different um, scale now. But it shows you that there's insulation in the header. This is a header, by the way. A header is over an opening of some kind. Um, there's the brick on the outside. There's a gear, air gap between the brick that allows moisture to pass through. That's a batting insulation. And then this material on the inside, basically a structure of some kind that's holding the uh, sheetrock that then gets painted. Another wall section, another wall section. Yeah, now here we have stair sections that have dimensions associated with them. So if we come over here, you know right there that the total rise here from here to here is six foot five inches. So they figure out a way to tell you, to, once this is all designed, they figure out a way to determine the actual riser height. The riser height is a distance from this point right here to this point right there. Now, very seldom a riser is a whole number. But if you design the building, you design it in such a way that you have a total rise that can be equally divided by 11 and end up with seven. Seven inches is the standard target for the, a safe stair. Now, a safe stair is called a 7-Eleven rule. Going up seven and over 11, up seven and over 11, that is the safest set of stairs in the sense that it's the set of stairs that is least likely to cause you to trip. And they know that from long experience. So 711, in fact, the Boca code was going to change the requirements for residents to always be 711. But the problem with that is the standard Cape Cod house that has a stairway in the middle of the house could not be built if they did that because making those treads 11 inches long and making the requirement be only seven inches in height created a stair at an angle that would have interfered with the front door. So if you're looking at the side of the stairs in a cape house and there's your front door, frequently the front door is right where the stairs are. And that space right there, if you went to a 7-Eleven, was so small that you would have to make the house wider in order to be able to open the door. In many, many houses are Cape Cod style that have already been designed. So builders did not like that rule. I don't know, Jake, have you ever encountered that, the 7-Eleven rule? Yeah, it, it, uh, especially in older houses who didn't have the 7-Eleven rule or the three-foot landing or the three-foot at the bottom of the stairs, yeah. it makes it fun. Yeah, it, just, it was impossible. I mean, if you go into a house and do a renovation, go, yeah, I'm going to do a 7-Eleven stair, it's like, Oh, wait a minute, the front door doesn't open anymore. So, you know, you work with what you've got. Um, you know, really 710 is a, is a perfectly good stair. Six and a half, 10, seven and a quarter, seven and a half. Those, there's nothing wrong with any of those, but you know, there is a kind of target that you, that you go for. So anyway, they ended up with an exact high riser height of seven inches on this because it was designed specifically 
to fit that space. And the space was designed to fit that stair. That's different than that boilerplate stair that we saw earlier where they didn't give you the total rise because they didn't know what it was. Here they know what the total rise is because they know they've designed the building. I have kind of a quick uh, random yeah. question yeah. while you're on the subject. I noticed in like a lot of homes, like the front door goes, leads right up into the stairs. Mm -hmm. Is there like a, um, like a reason for that? Or is it like a safety thing or fire code? Um, Not a fire code. It's, it's just really easier to build. What's that? Is it just easier to build it that way? Well, you know, I, I'm going to let Jake weigh in on this as well. But you know, Cape's, the Cape Cod style house was a very functional design. It had a center chimney generally. The center chimney yep. um, helped warm the house. The stairs in the middle divided the house into rooms that were reasonable sizes on either side. The stairs going up normally have another set of stairs coming down. The stairs coming down go to the cellar, the stairs going up go to the second floor. So it's just a very efficient layout. Um, and then the front door was put there because that way you didn't have a door opening directly into a room, which is, you know, if you have an outside door opening directly into a room, it's not as effective as having a, either a mud room or an entryway or, a, you know, atrium or something. And so it basically created a, an entryway um, in the house with, with an efficient layout. Jake, you want to add anything or do you want to, you want to dispute any of that? No, that, that sounds good. Um, and typically, you know, in the smaller capes, having this, the staircases in the center gave decent sized living rooms, kitchens on either sides of the staircase, yeah. instead of having to deal with a staircase in the middle of a room or, you know, on either side. Yeah. Uh, in other words, you take, a, you take a structure, Matthias, and you say, all right, I'm going to divide this into rooms. You know, the first thing you do yeah. is put a line down the middle in both directions. Yeah. You, Here's my rooms. Okay, what am I going to do? Well, I need some space here. I got I to gotta have some space for the stairs. Put them on one wall, and you've made one of those rooms smaller. And you've also, um, well, you've made one of those rooms smaller, and you've also dictated that the stairs of the cellar have to be there as well. So it was basically a, a, just a design decision that was made many, many years ago. And people huh. tend to like capes. They're really, you know, conventional, traditional side mm -hmm. of their houses. But it's that fact that they're in the middle of the, of, the, of the house and go right to the front door that has caused the problem with the rate at which the stairs go up. So if you have stairs, you know, if you said, gee, I think a six inch rise and a 12 inch tread would be awesome. The stairs just can't be fit into a standard cape sized house without making it really wide. Right. So, so is that is a little bit of a of a of a clash between tradition and safety that's causing that. Um, but I but I think Jake is right. It just gave you sort of similar sized size rooms that you could use for different purposes without having to you know have one skinny room and one fat room. Those are technical terms. Those are builders' <laughs> terms. Skinny rooms and fat rooms. Uh, stair details, again, we're not going to look at these too much, but, you know, there are specific details in the stairs. Most of these are also boilerplate, and most of these probably don't have a scale, do they? Oh, no, they don't. They do. Yeah, all right. So these do have scales because they've got specific dimensions. Um, so in this particular case, instead of being an eighth-inch scale, it's in a quarter-inch, so it's a larger scale than for the floor plan itself so that you could see the detail a little bit more. But if you look down here... That's a half inch scale. In other words, we need even more uh, larger scale for the, for, to see this. Then we come over here where there's even more detail that you need and you go to an inch and a half equals a foot scale. So that's four times larger than the floor plan scale. And this is six times larger. Um, no, I'm sorry. It is it's 12 times larger than the floor plan scale. Um, and as a result, those little scale bars are different. These probably are boilerplate still because they, the same kind of details they use, but they can tell you the specific sizes because in this case, the sizes are, they're not connected necessarily to the overall rise and run. But some of these, they are connected. Like this one over here, and unlike the one we looked at earlier that had not to scale, that's the specific stairs for, these, for this particular building. And then what you're looking at here is an I-beam. I-beam is a type of structural beam and you're going to find that here because there's so much weight concentrated in that spot because that's got to be open right there. More details. Okay, window types and details. 
here's where we find the sill detail. Like right here, for instance, we looked at that earlier. That's got the birch sill and it's got the apron on it as well. Yeah. Oh my God, it's almost two o'clock. You poor people, I've been talking steadily for almost the entire time. Um, Boy, these classes go by fast. I don't know what it is. The, your class in particular, it always surprises me when we're done. Um, well, with, with this is the uh, ceiling plan. And the ceiling plan, pretty obvious, bunch of lights. And those are the little square panels in the ceiling. We were doing something one time and Jake called out the size of the, of the room we're in, which is this room right here, so close and I was sure that I knew why, and I think that was the one, Jake, we just counted the ceiling tiles, right? Yeah, the ceiling tiles or the floor tiles. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Either one. They're, they're, they're one foot apiece. So he just counted them across and uh, knew what we were looking at. Um, but again, there's nothing particularly interesting about that. You just have to hang the suspended ceiling on it. This is a floor um, finish and these are all the tiles in the floor and those are the, the vinyl actually they're they're not just vinyl they're really rugged ceramic vinyl tiles it's amazing every time i come in after they've they've gone through and they've stripped them and redone them the floors always look great and if those were standard linoleum the floors in that building would look terrible All right, let's get past the architectural. Let's look at some of the structural stuff here. All right, here's the structural. These are beam designations and joist designations. So the W18 by 35 is a way of sizing a, um, a particular beam, steel beam. And the beams are going to go the length of the building, and then the studs that are going to, I mean, the uh, joists are going to come in and, and um, connect to those beams and be supported by the beam. The W is just a particular shape or type of beam. Um, the 18 is the size of the beam and 35 is the number of pounds per foot. And that's how beams are designated. Um, you know, there are specific dimensions associated with that particular beam. Uh, but this one's heavy, I mean, heavy beam because it's the one that goes right down through the center. This one over here is a shorter beam. It doesn't go as far. The span it's supporting is much smaller, so you can see it's got a it's a smaller beam to begin with, and it weighs 22 pounds per foot instead of 35. So it's just a smaller beam because it wasn't the need to be bigger. Um, sizing metal beams is a really critical and important skill. That um, the one time I that I designed something with a beam, I went to my colleague Ed Fitzgerald who did this stuff all the time. I said, "This is the beam I came up with. What do you think?" He goes. I think it's twice as heavy as it needs to be. <laughs> and he did some calculations and we ended up with a beam that was actually deeper, but weighed almost half of what I had come up with um, because he just knew more about it than I did. And the beauty of that is it was a far less expensive beam and it was far easier to deal with. Normally in residential construction, the last thing you want is an I-beam because bringing an I-beam in on a site is a whole lot different than laminating up some two by eight or two by 10. I don't know, Jake, if you've ever dealt with I-beams on a site like that before, but you don't have two guys pick those up on their shoulders and walk around with them. No, they, may, they make I-joists now, um, but usually it's an LVL or a Paralam or a flitch beam. Yeah. Yeah, they, they're basically I-beams made out of wood. They're laminated wood. There are still some situations. The one I used, it was, it was, a, it was just an open span that was just too long to support be supported by any and it had to have a certain minimum had to have a certain maximum depth um and it was in the garage so you know on, a, on occasion even with residential you end up with a situation where an i-beam makes a sense it's interesting though i-beams are terrible in a fire people tend to think of steel as being better than wood if you have a fire but a wooden beam will never sag it'll eventually burn through steel when it gets hot it loses its strength. And so I saw a photograph one time of a commercial fire and there were four steel beams that had just draped over a wooden beam. That was the, in other words, this building was an old building and the original building had a wood beam, solid wood beam down the middle. And then they added to the building and the stories they added above had steel beams and the steel beams all just sagged and collapsed and the fire never burned through the main wood beam. 
that was just sitting there draped with iron over it that was looked like spaghetti that had been cooked and then draped over something. But it is extremely strong. And in a situation, you know, I, one other situation I saw being, being used was when there were going to be cars parked on a floor that had to be supported. It was an opening under the floor. Roof framing, we can just skip. I'm just kind of going down through and seeing if there's anything I wanted to. Yeah, two other things, and then I'm going to ask if you have any questions and then let you go. Um, plumbing. <clears throat> plumbing is laid out schematically. So these are all plumbing lines, and the letters designate different purposes for the, for the lines. Um, and these line types, if you're doing something in AutoCAD, these are, these are cases where I would create a line type. So in this particular case, that's a cold water line. It's a two inch line, a pretty good size line. The lines in your house are probably a half inch. And they have to be designated a certain way. But the, but the schematic is, that's a pipe of some kind. Pipe comes down and turns. But if you're looking down and the pipe turns in a way that you can't identify, in other words, this pipe goes and makes a right-hand turn in plan view. But then it comes up, which right now is out of the, out of the uh, drawing at you. Um, and they tell you up right here. But those little lines right there means the pipe's coming up and making a 90-degree turn coming straight up vertically from the floor plan. And those symbols are used specifically to show that that's how the plumbing works. So that's one of the few, th that's one of the things about a plumbing schematic that you've got to be aware of. I don't see anything else here right now that is unusual. Yeah, all right, let's go down and see if we can get some electrical stuff. Um, so this is another sheet that has legends on it because it's for the mechanical. So if you look up here now, <clears throat> all of these abbreviations have to do with plumbing, mechanical, um, the uh, mechanical, electrical, and plumbing kinds of things. And the general notes all have to do with ductwork. And that's because this is the beginning sheet on the mechanicals. Now we get to the mechanicals, and this is really interesting. These are actually drawings of the ducts themselves. So the heat system from the mechanical room, heat comes down, this is the first floor, heat comes through that big ductwork, the sheet metal ductwork, the big rectangular thing, comes out here and turns up and it's gonna go up to the various floors and then come in and bring heat in through the ceilings on each of the individual floors, heat or cold air. Oh, and the, the grid that I was talking about before, I talked about column designations, <clears throat> this grid system allows you to go through and identify locations. And so the E represents rows and the numbers represent columns. So there's a column seven and a row E and they come together and it's essentially a Cartesian grid for locating things. The first floor ductwork plan, oh. kind of crazy. Um, yeah. Uh, but you know, here's one of those things where you look at it and go, oh my God, what's going on? But then you say, all right, let me just look and see what's happening. You, un you understand that it has to be on a floor plan so you can see where it's located. But a lot of the detail here could have been eliminated. They didn't need to show you all the detail on that first floor. All you really need is the outline of each room. And now, but what they did is they made the line weight really heavy on the ductwork itself. But that's what's going on in the ceiling. Of the, of the room that we're in right the one the room where we have our classroom. This is what's happening up there in that ceiling. And the ceiling has areas right here where air comes down through. And then um, the ductwork goes into the middle area, goes down through the corridor. So all of this ductwork has to be laid out by somebody and that's the plan for doing the ductwork. And I do not remember exactly what that designation means. Hmm. Jake, you know? Say that again? I don't remember exactly what these numbers mean on the ductwork. It's uh, like R8 is the return 
number, you know, the eighth return, S3 is the supply air. And then I think it, that also gives what, um, you know, the cubic meters. Yeah, that's the volume, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, good, thank you. So there's a supply line and a return line. You know, air is coming in, air is going back. And that's the size of the ductwork. That allows 365 probably cubic feet of air to move through in a minute. And that's 1300, that's a much larger system. Thank you, I, I had just completely forgotten what that meant. Although if I'd looked at the legend, I would have been able to figure it out. Piping, 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 more piping, details. Yeah, schedules. Now here's like nothing but words. There's no drawings here at all, but this is the air handling schedule, all the units, the registers, everything else. You have to put them someplace. You, and sometimes they're in, in packets that are called specification packets, which are essentially eight and a half by 11 little books. Sometimes they're put right on the drawing itself. I like it on the drawing itself myself because then you can find them. But all this is is just essentially big tables that you would normally put in a document. Then we have another legend here specifically for the electrical. And you know, these will look familiar to you. Duplex receptacles, we looked at some of the switching things, three-way switches, four-way switches. And I just wanna end by looking at one of the electrical plans with the switching. Not want lighting, I want. All right, let's take a look at this one. Oh, okay, this is a circuit diagram. Remember I had you guys do a circuit diagram? And what it's showing you is that these are the circuits. This is a three conductor right here. And the reason it's a three conductor is because you're looking at split receptacles. So in the classroom, all those receptacles that go along the floor, all of them are fed by different circuits, but they're all split. And they're all split so that one side of the duplex, one, well, up and down. So you got duplex receptacle with two plugs. One of the plugs is on one circuit, the other plug is on another circuit. And you can see that those two are connected and that's the circuit number right there. They're split carrying three conductors because that circuit is a split circuit. There's 120 and another 120. One side goes to one side of this and the other one goes to the other side. So that if you're plugging in two different devices in the same duplex receptacle, they're not, they're not pulling off of the same circuit. So if you happen to have two things plugged in that are pulling a lot of current, you're less likely to blow the fuse. But all those arrows are home runs. Duplex receptacles that aren't split look like this. That's just a standard old duplex receptacle. A, um, a uh, communications drop right there in the offices. And in the classrooms, they don't have the IT stuff. Oh yeah, they do. Those are all drops right there. Those triangles are all drops that you plug computers into. And those originally came from the plan that I drew. Yeah, this is, uh, <laughs> this is the room that things got messed up. This is my original drawing right here of the way the desks are gonna be lined up. And that's the door. And when I finally, when I, the building was done and I came in, that door had been moved over here. And so they just put the same setup. They just pushed everything back this way. So they still had the same number of tables and, and uh, seats. And I think the door is actually right in this area right here now. But it was enough so I had to get pushed that back. Well, I walk in and go, what an idiot I am. How did I do that? I laid this out so you can't get in here. And if you know, if you've been in that room right now, it's not set up this way at all. There's some tables that are turned sideways to give us more room. But that's a case where when they finally, when they did the work, they put a beam that came right through that opening, came in, coming down at an angle. They needed a triangle to prevent racking. And so the structural people put it in, everything was fine. And when they came in to put the doors in to do the finish work, there was a, there was a uh, beam that went through that where that opening went. So they just moved the door over. They didn't tell me in advance, so I didn't have a chance to redo the orientation of the layout of the, uh, of the room. And as a result, it was a mess. So we ended up bringing some stuff over here. We had another row on here. 
I turned some things here. We still ended up, we need an area in every room, needs an area in the front, partly for a wheelchair turning area. You have to have a five foot diameter turning radius, a turning a diameter. Um, so that if somebody comes in in a wheelchair, they can turn it around. Um, did I say diameter? I don't mean diameter, I don't think. Do I mean radius? Let me think. No, it is a diameter. Uh, at any rate, that's the uh, electrical plan. And the last thing I want to look at, and then we're done with this, is the panel distribution. Yeah, the panel board schedules. What these schedules have is indications of all the circuits. Now, this is just one panel. And this one panel had, and this is, well, it could be the panel outside my office. There are three panels outside my office. There are three panels on, this, on the first floor and there's more panels on the, on the ground floor. But they are designating what, what's on that circuit. And so here are the receptacles in the classroom 220, other receptacles here indicate what the, what the current load is, how many watts it's being sized for. And this is essentially a list of all the circuits that go into that panel. And that's all the panels and all the circuits that are in that building. So your house might have like that much stuff in it. This building has that much stuff in it. And is that, that's the last sheet right there. <laughs>